it's time for my end. The, uh, before we get started, I actually want to say Paul Southern is still out, and uh, hopefully he'll be back next week. Uh, I can't remember last week that we were here or not, if I announced that his dad passed away and, and this. Yeah. So, but anyway, he will be back hopefully next week. And what I've tried to do this week is do our audio, video, and I think we've kind of got all that stuff working, but unfortunately I don't have a high end song and all that other kind of stuff working, but, but anyway, we'll kind of get by without having that, because that is kind of a fun part, I think, of high end, kind of the, the drama, bringing the drama back into the room. Another thing I'd like to announce, I really want to appreciate uh, and announce our speaker today, Dr. David Deming from the University of Oklahoma. The, uh, he's going to be our keynote speaker. He's going to talk about liberalism and possibly not only OU, but the other universities around the country and, uh, and hopefully private and, uh, and our state universities. But anyway, when we get started here, we need to start with an open prayer. I'm going to ask, the, uh, please shut your telephones off, your ringers off. The, uh, and uh, what I'd like to do, I'm going to ask Pastor uh, J.P. Taylor if uh, he will do our uh, opening prayer, and I will start to do our Pledge of Allegiance and American flag after that. Thank you. J.P. Draw by your hands, please. Our gracious Father, we humble ourselves in your presence because you are God. Father, we thank you that you love us. Thank you, Father, that you care for us, that you want nothing but the best for us. Father, we ask that you be with us on the meal. Uh, for those who are eating, we ask, Father, for a blessing on the meal. Uh, we ask, Father, that uh, you be with the speaker, uh, give him wisdom, discernment, insight. And may your anointing be upon you as well. Thank you, Father, for this time that we can gather. Thank you for all that you do. May everything that we say, do, and think bring glory and honor to your name. And it's in Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Let me kind of give you an idea of how this meeting today started, or why one kind of want to have this meeting today to talk about liberalism or university. Here two or three weeks ago, I can't remember exactly when it was, but do we remember what happened with the Trump, what I'm going to call the Donald Trump rally in Berkeley, California, where there was people trying to have a uh, Trump rally and people were assaulting him from the opposition side, assaulting older people and doing that. And it's kind of very frustrating because to me, it's, it appears to me that only one party the liberal part of our government or these thinkers only want one party to actually have a conversation. And they also want to accuse conservatives on the right side of the aisle of being uh, insensitive, uh, uncaring, and whatever, whatever kind of adjective you want to add to that. So we're to part of it. But, but during the Tea Party movement, which, you know, I never really was officially a Tea Party person, even though I attended a lot of Tea Party. So I don't know if there was a membership or whatever, you know, and I kind of deal like that, whatever. But, but anyway, you know, I never seen anybody get insulted, and I never seen any grounds being, after the, the, the uh, meetings were any kind of a litter on the grounds and all this other kind of stuff, I never seen that. The, uh, now, I'm not going to say there wasn't any of that ever, but it appears to me that on the liberal side of this deal, we're seeing riots. We're seeing, they're really not protests. They're, to me, they're like riots an aggressive type behavior. Trying to shut down your freedom of speech if you have a different thought than, than what they do. So, now knowing all that, what kind of transfers in my brain and my, the way I process different things, I thought, who could I actually get to come to, to High Noon Club and discuss the, what am I say, the conservative side of this from a university standpoint? There's nobody that I could come up with better that I could ever think of than Dr. David Dinning, who's a speaker, who's a professor at the University of Oklahoma. The uh, very conservative type thinker. I've read lots and lots, as you probably have to, his different articles that he's, that he's provided. And at one time, I was kind of kidding him, and he refused to do this. I said, would you please be my press secretary? He said, no. 
He said, he said he's way too smart for to be for to be. He, uh, So, and I had to probably agree with him on that at the same time. Another thing that got into my mind to think about this a number of years ago is I kind of sh used to shoot shotguns kind of semi-professionally. Never could really make any money at the deal, but you kind of do that. You travel all the country shooting shotguns and shooting sporty clothes. And one of my shooting partners was a guy by the name, I'm going to use his name too, the, uh, is uh, Dr. Murray Hamilton. And uh, Murray, we were out shooting one day and, and uh, on one occasion, and we got to talk about different things and the way you do uh, after shooting a few of these targets and with it, walking to different stations. And he started telling me when he went to OU Medical School how they had a program, one of their, I must say, semester or, or certain part about pornography. He went through OU Medical School. And I thought, well, that's kind of absurd. But I actually kind of get a kid one another. And I thought, well, he's a kid. I mean, why, why, why would somebody going to be a physician want to learn about pornography? But anyway, so I started questioning him uh, regarding that matter, and he told me, he said, well, their thought was, is that a medical doctor needs to understand every activity a patient actually does. And I thought, Murray, that, no, that, no, you don't, we don't need to know all that stuff. We, there's no way. And he, he wasn't arguing in favor of that. He was just explaining to me his position on that or what the position of the uh, University of Oklahoma, the medical school, was doing at that time. So I told him, I said, now if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of use your name. I'm going to drop your name around. I'm going to probably ruin you a little bit, but that's, that's going to be okay. So I got a hold of, of uh, representing Mike Reynolds. Does anybody in the room do, do not know Mike Reynolds? The uh, very, what I'm going to say, and I'd say it very kind, very aggressive type legislator, to say the least. But anyway, we did that, I did that, and then I also got a hold of Dr. Mike Ritz, who's a House member out of Tulsa, Broken Arrow. Through the time, and I can't remember exactly how long that actually took, but I know it was less, I think, less than a year. They do not offer that at only medical school any longer. So, knowing that, if we do know what's going on at our universities, we can change the dynamics at different times. That doesn't mean we're going to change it all. Maybe we're not supposed to change it all. But unless we know what's actually going on, we'll never be able to change anything. And that's what why I'm so interested in having Dr. Demi come talk to us about the liberalism at the University of Oklahoma. The, uh, now knowing all that stuff, I'm going to ask Dr. Demi to please take over. One additional thing we're going to do today, this will be the first time. We're going to do Facebook Live. We're going to attempt to do High Noon Club Facebook Live. Now, if we do a total failure of that, please do not private message me and tell me how, what an awful person I am or what I'm, and how I'm not a technical genius because I admit to it before we ever start, I'm not. So anyway, Dr. Denny, the microphone is just fine. I'm done. Hopefully, I will look. You will come around to the point that it's worse than you possibly could have thought beforehand. Uh, before I get into events at OU, I thought I would take just a couple minutes to, to, to talk about myself, give you some background of who I am, how I came to be here. I'm actually a native Hoosier, uh, was born in Terre Haute, Indiana. I grew up mostly in Indianapolis. My first degree, believe it or not, was in psychology from Purdue University. After that, I went and worked for a few years, went back to school in 1981, uh, graduated from Indiana University with a geology degree, and then went straight to graduate school in geophysics and received my, my PhD in, is it 1988 or 89 up there? And then I did a, a couple of temporary research jobs, including about the Euro U.S. Geological Survey, and then came to OU in 1992, and so now I've been a professor at OU for 25 years. 25 years and a few months. Now, a, a common criticism I get, because I write a lot of editorials in the Oklahoma and other places, is, is people telling me, uh, who are you as a geologist to lecture us on that socialism is a bad system? or that what the Second Amendment means, 
or to talk about politics at all, or any of these other things that you discourse on. And, and actually, the truth is, and now I do know actually a little bit more than geology, because when I got to about the age 45, I began to fully come to an appreciation, begin to appreciate the levels of my own ignorance. And I realized all my education had only trained me really as a narrow technical specialist. So at that age, I, I went back and I started to re-educate myself literally in almost every area of human knowledge. And I ended up, as a result of that, uh, writing uh, the books that you see up there. It's a history of science in four volumes and that's taken up most of my time over the last uh, 15 years. And if you look at, if you go through these books, I think you'll see they deal not only with science, but also uh, religion, philosophy, economics, even military history. Because it's my conviction, I, I think this is the right view, that all areas of human knowledge are interrelated. And for example, even if you look at the way religion is treated in this series, you'll find the biography of, of Jesus Christ, of St. Paul, of Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, uh, I could talk to you about Islam, and yes, Islam, it's, it's worse than you think. Uh, there's, a, there's a history of Islam in the second volume of this series. And so now you see, I'm a little bit dangerous, because I actually know what it is I'm talking about. A <laughs> uh, couple disclaimers. First of all, as always, I'm not a spokesperson for the university. I'm speaking today. Everything I'm, I'm saying is my individual viewpoint, it's my opinion, under my, my First Amendment right to speak my mind on matters of public concern. Secondly, there'll be somebody who will say, because you're talking about problems at OU, you're against education. No, exactly the opposite. I'm in favor of education. What I'm opposed to is political indoctrination. So the first step in, in solving any problem is recognizing that it exists. And the, the quote up here, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Uh, lost her. Okay. Uh, I saw that for the first time, I think, on my old professor's door when I was an undergraduate. I believe in that. I believe in education. Okay. And, and third disclaimer, finally, um, as I go through this, I think you'll find, as any reasonable person would, that, that much of it is unbelievable. And so I can only tell you, I'm not making this up. Because it's often the case that truth is always stranger than fiction. What actually led to me being invited today was I wrote a column about Harry Belafonte's appearance at OU last month. It was printed in the Edmund Sun. The Oklahoma rejected it. Uh, don't reject anything that's critical of OU in the least bit. And uh, I, I Bob saw that, you invited me here. Uh, let's go back a couple months, November. We had an election in this country, and, and Donald Trump in Oklahoma received 65% of the vote. It was one of the highest polls, I think third highest in the whole, whole uh, United, of, of all the 50 of the United States. And there was something else that took place in Oklahoma. There was, I think, a state question, was it 779, that put forth a penny sales tax to support education, including higher education. And David Bourne and other people lobbied for it. And it was rejected, I think, pretty convincingly by 60 to 40 percent. And I'm looking at that, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that if the higher education lobby, their, their task now is if they want the people in the states to support higher education, they have got to make a connection. They've got to reach out to those two-thirds of the Oklahomans who voted for Donald Trump. And so what did they do? They did exactly the opposite. They invited this guy, Harry Belafonte, here to speak. Now, who is Harry Belafonte? As you all know, he's a musician, and I'm sure he's a very accomplished one. But they didn't invite him here to sing. They invited him here as a political activist. And he has quite a record as a political activist, stretching back to the late 1940s, but he's now in his 90s. And who is this guy? And, and before I go any further, okay, I, I, I am in favor of the First Amendment. I am in favor of anybody, no matter how radical, how controversial, as long as they're not inciting people to violence, they're being able to speak freely. And so we ought to be able to speak here, at OU or anywhere, 
Okay, but that's not what happened. He wasn't just allowed to speak. This guy was celebrated. He was advertised. He was held up as a role model for students. He was invited to a presidential dinner with David Warren and, and, and celebrated. And so who is this guy? Well, he's been described, as it says in the slide here, as an unreconstructed Stalinist. This is a guy whose entire career, politically, has been dedicated to, to one thing, and that is expressing a hatred for the United States of America. And what is the... the put my glasses back on here. And here are some of the quotes from him. He says, the United States is a villainous nation responsible for global poverty and hunger. Um, he compared the United States government to the 9-11 terrorists who brought down the World Trade Center. In fact, he even went further than that. He said, we deserve what we got. We got what was coming to us because of our horrible record. being responsible for all of the ills of the world. Uh, OU describes him in a press release as a civil rights activist and a humanitarian. He's not. The guy is a totalitarian. He's praised Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. These are countries in which there is no personal or an economic freedom. You go to Venezuela or Cuba today, you stand on the street corner and start criticizing the government, you are going to be arrested and thrown in prison indefinitely so quickly your head will spin. And, and you look at, look at what socialism has done to Venezuela. You follow the news at all, they're taking that country literally back to the Stone Age. Um, so uh, I thought, you know, you've got to reach out to people and instead what they did is insulted us all. Just a, just a couple months. Uh, before he appeared here, or immediately after the election, uh, Bill Avanti said that the presidency of Donald Trump will be the fourth Reich. And what is the inference from that? There's only, the inescapable corollary is that 65% of the people in Oklahoma voted for him are Nazis. These are the people who support the University of Oklahoma. We are the taxpayers. That university does not belong to the faculty and all of the radical political radicals. It belongs to us. Yep. And to insult us in this way is just, I thought, unbelievable. Okay. It gets worse. <laughs> this, is, this is like a quick, quick rundown of what I call the politicization of the university, which I've witnessed now over the last 20 years. And, and you understand, I don't have time. I have to you know, do my research and my teaching. I don't have time to like, spend all my time researching this and running into everything. But this is just a few, this is the tip of the proverbial iceberg. We have at OU you now freshman quote diversity training. At OU diversity, the word diversity means that you hire, retain, and 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 befriend people who think just like you do, radical left wingers. Okay? And this is not training. Training is learning how to operate a fire extinguisher. This is political indoctrination. We have a we have a social justice center. And you know the word social justice has a code word for radical left-wing politics. It's unbelievable to me that the state of Oklahoma funds it. You pay for this. We pay for this. For people to be, you know, that for, 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 for to, they have all center devoted to it. We pay for it. We have studies programs, women's studies, African-American studies, Native American studies. None of these studies programs are now, nor have they ever been, legitimate field of academic inquiry. They are simply devoted to political indoctrination. And of them all, the, the single worst, the, the, it, it's like the one that, they, that started this whole process, and it's like a cancer seed that spreads all of this, is the Women's Studies program. And, and I was there when they, they brought it in. And, and you realize, we're not, they're not, when you say women's studies, you're not talking about things that we all agree on like equal pay for equal work. We're talking about very radical, totalitarian stuff. And, and think of the word, this is why they invented the word feminazi. These are the kind of people you're talking about. We have a gender inequality, so we have a gay lounge. Now, now why in the world we need a gay lounge, I don't know. What takes place there, I don't know. Nobody discriminates against gay people anymore. Why do they have to have, you know, you know if they have, like, sit aside the room and said, this is the Christian lounge, or the conservative lounge, why people would turn purple and smoke would come out of their ears. Uh, as you all know, we had the, the, the Ten Commandments monument had to be taken down from the state capitol because you can't spend state money on promotion of religion. 
Yeah, that's exactly what they do at OU. They have an Islamic prayer room. And if you ask OU, you'll say, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. That's a reflection room. And it's open to every student. But, and that's right, it is open to every student. But it's also it's stocked with copies of the Quran and pamphlets on Islam. And it was originally opened at the request of the Islamic students. And, and you know, and I, if they want to pray, pray, I have no problem with it. Why do they need a separate... And I try to get people in the media in there. I say, this is out so outrageous that you're doing this. And everybody turned and said, well, well, oh, you said it's a reflection room. You know, they just accept whatever the university press office says. And some academic departments, in fact, many of them have become hopelessly politicized, in my opinion. One of the worst is the history of science department. And I learned a couple years ago, one of the things they're doing is they conduct seminars for students in which they, they do what I, what I would call teaching racial hate. Here are some of the things they teach students in these seminars. First of all, they teach what's called white privilege, which is evidently something invented by a, a feminist professor a few years ago. And it, the, the essence of white privilege is that if you're white, you're racist. Period, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're white, and you're, you're racist as a condition of your of your uh, birth, basically. Um, every woman, homosexual, poor person, the person of color is oppressed and disenfranchised. You're told to work in solidarity with oppressed groups and to join feminists and activist communities. I'm just saying, my place. That's not education. That's straightforward political indoctrination, activism. Uh, they're, they're caught the concept of racist microaggressions. And what that means is you're supposed to see racist insults everywhere. An example of a racist microaggression is telling a student, if you work hard enough, you will succeed. I'm not making this up. <laughs> now, when I saw this, I said, you know what? If you tell people that they are hopelessly oppressed, and that, and that, and, and that, Hard work is not a, an, av an avenue for advancing yourself in life. They, they will resort to violence. And that's exactly what happened. Here's the sort of thing. There are ten ways you can actively reject your white privilege. And I'm going to give you one through nine, but number ten is breathtaking. This is what you're taught. Recognize that you're still racist no matter what. <laughs> We've come a long way, have we not, from people wanting to be judged on the content of their character instead of the color of their skin. And I said, I said, you want to understand why we had this incident with the SAE students chanting these vile racial epithets on the bus? Well, maybe they've been exposed to this and they reject it, and I think they ought to reject it. We now have a team of 20 administrators who respond to so-called reports of bias. They have, OU has an anonymous reporting system. If somebody feels like you said something politically incorrect, this is just like any totalitarian system, or like, you know, from the, the Middle Ages in Europe, the Inquisition. You can be report, you can have somebody report on you anonymously. Now think about what that means. You cannot, you deny the right to confront your accuser. You could be accused by anyone of anything at any time. And they have 20, 20 administrators. This is a, a screenshot, right? I didn't make this up. This is a, a screenshot right from the start who respond to this and go after you. And, and you know what? If you're ever hauled into one of these administrative hearings, you have no due process rights. I've been through it, believe me. I, went, I, was, I was brought up before this many years ago. And... And my attorney later told me, he said, if I hadn't seen this, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, they started questioning me, not only on what I had allegedly done, but on my attitudes, my convictions, and my beliefs. And, they, and, and, and when they learned I was a member of the National Rifle Association, it was just like, the very next question was, was do you think the Nazis were bad people? Like, if you were a member of the NRA, it was equivalent to being in the Nazi party. One of the, the big problems is, in the last few years, the campus newspaper, the student newspaper has degenerated into 
I mean, literally one of the worst newspapers in the world. You, you, you ever look, turn on, like, and, and we all know the national news media, and CNN is about the worst. They have given up any pretense of objectivity. Mm -hmm. Why, where are these people trained? They're trained in the journalism schools. <laughs> and if you look at, and this is a, a story where the, where, uh, the, the OU Daily became a, the, almost the laughing stock of the nation a couple years ago when they ran the story that, that women's new colored underwear is racist. And so they look and everywhere they see, they see, they see racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, xenophobia, inequity and social injustice. You know? And there's no pretense of objectivity. Why? Well, you, don't you understand? By attempting neutrality, news organizations like the ONU Daily become oppressors. Should they ever attempt to become objective, according to this opinion column, which has run recently, then they become one of this, this, this social system of oppression. Do you see? And here's where I'm going to, to, to disagree with Bob. And I'll explain to you as we go on. We're not talking about liberalism, because liberals, are people who, I know liberals, have liberal friends, they believe in things like democracy and free speech. These people we're talking about are not liberals. They are totalitarians. <laughs> we have had, in the last few years, an amazing rise of an almost countless number of these student radical groups at OU. And again, this is not a comprehensive list, but I'm through and listed some of them. Indigenize OU, Unheard, Brown Collective, Racial Distance Alliance, Queer Inclusion, Young Democratic Socialist, Student Liberation Coalition. The photograph on the right shows some of them outside the library chanting, No Trump, no KKK, no Fascist USA. And look at the symbols. If you look at their Facebook pages, the common symbol you see is the raise clenched fist. This is the symbol of terror and oppression. And, and if you look at the fist on the bottom, it's red. That red, uh, to me, represents the color of blood. Whose blood? Your blood. My blood. Because these are people who believe in violence. Now, let's look at one of these groups in a little more detail. This is one of the worst. Indigenize OU. Described itself, at least the founding members, as four radical native students fighting to decolonize and re-indigenize the university and state of Oklahoma. Really? We're going, how are we going to accomplish that? How are we going to decolonize the state of Oklahoma? If you drew your finger across your throat, I think that's right. It's called genocide. And it, yet, these people are, 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 are not only incredibly ignorant, okay, because the very name indigenize OU, as I pointed out, is an oxymoron. Because the indigenous peoples of the Americas uh, had no institutions of higher education. So literally, to indigenize OU is to destroy it. Okay? And, and how are you going to decolonize? I, I, are you going to take the, what, what percentage of our population today bears some descendants from the European colonists who started with Christopher Columbus, 70%, 80%? Are you going to deport 300 million people? Or are you going to engage in, in genocidal murder? Okay? Um, um, they consider Norman's 89er day to parade to be, quote, a celebration of genocide, land displacement, and forced removal. They want Columbus Day replaced, and notice I've underlined the word replaced by Indigenous Peoples Day. And I have no problem with Indigenous Peoples Day. Because American Indians or Native Americans, would they return to prefer, these are great people with great qualities. And they ought to be able to celebrate their heritage. But if you offer them, say, well, the week after Columbus Day will have Indigenous people, no, that is unacceptable. Because it's not, it's not enough for them to celebrate their heritage, they have to destroy your heritage. Don't you understand? Here's a quote from them. Trump support is synonymous with white supremacy and violence. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is listen to what they're saying. And listen very carefully. When they say, in other words, if you say, I support Trump, you, in their minds, you have made a violent attack on them, and therefore, Follow up with the inescapable corollary, their violence, when they attack you violently, it's justified because they're acting defensively. So if you hold up with like a rare Trump hat or something, they're justified in attacking you. Okay? 
And, and if, if, if you think that, that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this too far, I, I don't think I am. You might say to me, well, Professor Deming, it's a university campus. You always have a few of these radical students around and so on. And, and what do you get? It's always their rhetoric. Why do you? I, here's another guy. What, what is it? What, if you don't learn from history, you're going to repeat it. Here's another guy, a little less than 100 years ago. An eccentric guy, a little guy with a big mouth, very passionate. Uh, wrote a book called Mein Kampf, published in 1925. In 1925, the Nazi party in Germany is very, very small. It's like it's like 100 or 1 percent or something of the. And then eight years later, they had seized control of that country and outlawed all the other political parties and introduced a totalitarian system. And then within the space of 12 more years, we have 6 million people dead. And people said afterwards, well, how could we have possibly known that this guy was going to do this? He told you. This is a direct quote from Mein Kampf, an English translation, where he talks about taking, I think it is, what is it, 12 or 15,000 Jews and killing them with poison gas. He told you right at the beginning what he was going to do. And these people are telling you what they're going to do. I'm telling you right now, here in the United States of America, in the state of Oklahoma, the wolf is at the door right here and now. I'm sure you remember this. Dallas, last summer, we had five police officers assassinated. And this was an only incident. A police officer is being assassinated. Not, you understand, killed in, in pursuing criminals, but deliberately targeted and assassinated. And it happened during a Black Lives Matter protest. And so what is this group, Black Lives Matter? Well, it's a group, right, that's founded upon the lie. The lie that when uh, the film Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, that he had his hands up like this and was basically shot down and murdered. And that was investigated by the Green Jury, even by Obama's Justice Department, and found to be completely without merit. The police officer shot him because he was trying to murder the police officer. And, and this is a group that I think conservatives, meaning, again, these two-thirds of the people in Oklahoma, uh, view as a terrorist group. It's a group that some members have, at least some members, not every member, but every time, every place, some members have, at sometimes in places, publicly called for the assassination of police officers. And so no one be should surprise that that's in what you end up getting. And now we have a W, a vice president, who has publicly aligned, not just himself, but the university with Black Lives Matter. And again, you understand, if he wants to do that, speaking as an individual, I'm for him. That's his First Amendment right to speak out socially, politically, in any way he wants. I support that unconditionally. But I don't think that's what's happening. I think what he's doing is he is aligning the university with Black Lives Matter. And, and don't even get me started on the bureaucracy of OU. You know, uh, the people, the, the governor in the state makes $150,000 in our numbers. The U.S. Congress makes $175,000. And we have, and again, I haven't counted, I would bet there are probably 50 people at OU who make more than $200,000 a year. And none of this is necessary. The, it, they have an unbelievably bloated bureaucracy. And, and, and for them to go to the say, that we have an educational crisis, you know, and it's just, I just shake my head up. You know. Do we have allowed to be the president of that place? Sorry. As you know, uh, how am I doing on time, Bob? You okay? March 7, 2015, this is the day, free speech night. Uh, national incident, two members of the SAE fraternity, young men, they're probably inebriated, they're chanting vile, despicable racial epithets on the bus. And the university administration responds. Uh, the fraternity is immediately shut down. The two students are expelled without due process of law. And what develops on campus, and is still there to a certain degree, is what I can only call the lynch mob atmosphere. They were out to get these guys. At one point, there was some talk of even bringing criminal charges against them. The students' First Amendment rights were violated. These are quotes from legal scholars writing in USA Today and the Washington Post. In USA Today and the Washington Post, those are not exactly 
right wing, you know, uh, this is not Breitbart or some sort of uh, radical right wing uh, publication. Uh, Len Harlan Reynolds, uh, and particularly, I'll call your attention to Eugene Volok. So, this is a guy who, in my opinion, has possibly not only the most brilliant legal mind in the United States, but also the whole world. He graduated from college at something like age 14. Um, has been estimated when he was a youth that his IQ was over 200. Um, is an expert on both First Amendment and Second Amendment law. And he makes the point as reprehensible as it was, as what he said, it was constitutionally protected. There's no exception to the First Amendment for racist speech. In fact, uh, the First Amendment, in, in fact, only exists to protect offensive speech, because inoffensive speech doesn't need protection. Now keep in mind, the First Amendment is not just a, a suggestion. It's the law. And being the Constitution, when you violate the First Amendment, you're breaking the law. And that's exactly what happened. And because of that single incident, expelling those students without due process, fire, Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, named OU as one of the ten worst colleges for free speech last year, from the year before. In fact, what they said is that in many ways OU was the worst, because OU action in expelling those students summarily without any due process was taken as a role model, example, by other institutions. Now, I've underlined there the word due process. What do I mean by due process? We're talking about something that goes back not just to our Constitution, but goes back hundreds of years. Due process of law was guaranteed even in the version of the Magna Carta in the 14th century. Every man is, has a right to due process of law. Do I have a due process of law in this case? You have a right to have a hearing. You have a right to put on a defense. Uh, what happened to these guys was they were basically found guilty in secret, and then and the judgment was issued. They, they didn't even have a chance to put on any type of defense. Someone witnessed nothing. And, and keep in mind, when OU does this, OU is the government. This is a public university. This is the state of Oklahoma doing this. Depriving them of their ancient right that we had to fight for for hundreds of years and countless generations of veterans have died for. Just taken away, just like that. <coughs> it's getting worse. That's November. The restriction on speech intensifies. The faculty senate recommends reporting what they call hate speech to the OU police. President David Boring. Cases of hate speech, or these are direct quotes. Cases of hate speech or threats to members of our community should be reported immediately to the OUPD. Now, I agree, threats ought to be reported. But you, you know what? You shouldn't conflate threats with hate speech because what is hate speech? The fact is, there is no legal or objective definition of what hate speech is. In practice, hate speech means anything that somebody doesn't like. If you say on the OU campus, if you say, I support Trump, there are many people who would consider that to be hate speech and would call the police on you. We have the case. It's not up here. A few months ago, where there was a Christian, evidently a Christian student or person out proselytizing by passing out chick tracts. And, and most of you probably know what a chick tract is. It's one of these little Christian pamphlets. So he passes that one to an Islamic uh, professor, and she gets it, and what does she do? She calls the police on him. It's literally happened. Right? And, and as far as I know, the police didn't follow up and no one was arrested, you know, or harassed. But the idea that you can, or you can call the police, this is what they do in countries like Iran or Saudi Arabia. You try going there and passing out Bibles and see what's out quickly. See how quickly you last. Believe me. Okay? So there's no objective definition of hate speech. It's anything that people don't like. Also, to the extent that you have such a thing as hate speech, hate speech is protected speech. It's protected by the First Amendment. It's the law. And the law ought to apply to everybody or it means nothing. And finally, OU is the government. And it's a crime to deprive a person of the civil rights under color of authority. And First Amendment rights are civil rights. I pity the poor police officer who actually gets a complaint like this. What are they to do to this person who is engaging in this alleged hate speech? If they arrest them or even detain them, they violate that person's civil rights, and they are subject to a civil rights lawsuit under section 42, 1983. 
I, 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 it's unbelievable to me that, that, that you can have the, the, the police down on you for saying things that are politically incorrect. Now, um, I see, remember what we talked about indigenized OU, and they said they're, they're, they consider Trump's support to be an act of violence. Let's go back to last month in February. Trump announces his first travel ban, and a group of about 100 to 200 of these radical students, left-wing students, have a demonstration, a protest march on campus. And there are people who are protesting on the other side. Uh, the radicals got 200 people. Do you know how many uh, were there to support Mr. Trump? Two. 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 That's all we could get. It, that's just, it's just so sad. It's so pathetic. We got two people. You know, in part I realized that if you're a Trump supporter or conservative, part of the reason you can't demonstrate is maybe you you're, you're have a job. So. Okay, but two guys. Okay? And, and here's what happened. That they were attacked. And these are, please notice, these are direct quotes. I wasn't there. Okay, because if I'm there, I'm going to get in trouble. Okay, and, and I've already got plenty of trouble. But these are quotes from the newspaper story, which are based, it was in part based on video recordings, so I'm pretty sure it's completely accurate. Quote, the native student directed racial slurs and threats of the white student holding the American flag. He told them he was called a pasty immigrant, a white blankety blank, and threatened to whoop his, his white ass. Another student has his trunk flag stolen, his white hat, Knocked off his head by, I blanked out the student's name, because I'm not going to pick on individual students, I'm a professor. I mean, in a certain sense, even with students behaving badly, a responsibility to act in local parentis of indigenized OU. Right? And there you see it, right there. Now, you know what? When you can be physically attacked on the old campus, and these guys, you understand, they were not shouting or trying to interfere with the, the 200 protesters. They're just standing there, peacefully. Playing the American flag. Now, you know what? I think when, when you can be physically assaulted for displaying the American flag, we've got a problem. Yep. You've got a big problem here. Okay? And, and, and David Bork, who said, he said, I won't tolerate racism, yeah. said, as far as I know, the, the student who, who made the racist threat has had no administrative actions taken against him completely that, or whatsoever. That may be wrong. I don't know. I haven't seen anything, you know. And and this is what the uh, unlike what the SAE fraternity members were doing. This is what a lawyer would call a specific incredible threat. This is this is not protected speech. When you tell somebody to their face you're going to attack them, that is not that's you know the equivalent of shouting fire in the crowded the theater. This is a threat. This is not protected speech. Now, let's talk about David Warren, and I don't make personal criticism, so this is not meant in any way to be a personal criticism of Mr. Warren. After all, he's my boss, and what often happens to me, because I run a lot of editorials, is the response I get to some sort of personal criticism. I've been called so many names over the years, uh, I've lost track of them all. You know, idiot, uh, and, and much, much worse. And, and to me, when, when I see these remarks, to me, it only tells me the person who's making a personal attack doesn't have either the intelligence or the knowledge to make an effective rebuttal. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you know what? Even a bad person can make a good argument. And so that's why it's so stupid to just... Uh, so I'm not, I'm not making personal criticisms of this report, but this is a public university. And so I think it's... it's we have to question the policies. Because what I'm talking about here are the policies. And David Boren has always presented himself as an advocate of free speech. Even dating back to his time in the Senate. You may remember many years ago, uh, after the Supreme Court said it was constitutional under the First Amendment to burn the American flag, there was an effort to pass a constitutional amendment to outlaw flag burning. And, and David Warren voted against it. And he was interviewed, I believe, in Oklahoma, and he described himself, he said, I'm an absolutist when it comes to the First Amendment. And this is a quote from a letter he put in the student newspaper in 2001, where he talks about 
a policy of complete free speech applying to campus. And then he goes on, and I don't have the go on part here, and now I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you can look this up, it's on the internet, you can see it. And he said, where's the effect? He said, he said, when somebody says something offensive, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, the proper response is never to try to silence them, but only to express your own opinion in return. And I agree with that, I think that's marvelous. I think that's right. And that's 2001, but even as recently as 2011, he wrote put another letter to you daily. He says, I applied your recent editorials about the importance of free speech and the right to assemble for peaceful demonstration. I am in complete agreement with you. A university should be a free marketplace of ideas. Our goal must be to maximize free expression. For example, no permits is required for demonstrations in the South Oval. And that's wonderful stuff. I agree with that. That's so wonderful. But now let's fast forward to November of 2016. There's a demonstration on the South Oval. Two guys show up. And again, I wasn't there, so I'm going by the account to know you daily. And you can read that. It's still on the internet. Two guys show up. Just two guys, again. And they're holding up signs of protesting against Black Lives Matter. Not for it, you understand. They're against it. They don't want police officers assassinated. And after a time, evidently, like a crowd of 50, 100, something like that, of these radical students start gathering and shouting at them, you know, and, and, and there's like a confrontation. The police are called. And then David Bourne shows up. And, they, and these, again, these are not my words. These are all, look, these are in quotes. Okay, I'm a little bit careful about such stuff because I'm a college professor and I know how to quote. And David Bourne shows up with a megaphone and according to the report in the Daily, he's shaking in anger. He told these two guys to leave campus and he said, you have no place to be here. You have no right to be here. And he told the men you would have be arrested if they set foot on university property again. And they were escorted off by the OU police. Now, how do you reconcile that with this? And the answer is, I don't know. Okay? But today you show up, and, and keep in mind, this is, this is, a, this is our space. It belongs to the people of Oklahoma. We can't show up there and express our viewpoint. We're going to be arrested by the police. Okay, last slide. I will never understand why conservatives in this country have abandoned our institutions of higher education. Uh, this is where uh, OU, for example, is our flagship university. It's where we send not just our young people, but the best and the brightest. And what we're talking about now here is even is not even not even the destruction of our country, it's the destruction of Western civilization. Because our traditions of personal and political freedom originate not just with the U.S. Constitution, but all the way back to ancient Greece, 2,500 years ago. These are things that have taken a very, very long time to develop and earn. And what do, why are these people prevailing? Well, one thing, they have passion. We have apathy. They can get 200 people just like that. Yeah. We can get two. And the two, you know, we'll probably never do it again after going through that being attacked. I um, would come. <laughs> Well, maybe I, I wish we could get uh, able to show up. I wish we could. Um, I sure wonder what is the solution. And to the extent there's a solution, as most people know, if you have a political solution to be effective, it has to be bottom up, not top down. That won't work in this case. And the reason is that the single biggest problem you're going to have there are the faculty. The faculty are tenured, and I'm not in favor of getting rid of tenure which conservatives suggest over the years, because what would happen immediately is the five conservative professors of the thousand would be fired, and then they would start laughing at you for giving them exactly what they wanted. Okay? It has to be top down, uh, not bottom up. Uh, we need a conservative governor in regions. We have a Republican governor, but we don't have a conservative governor. We have a Republican legislature, and you know, that we don't have a conservative legislature. We don't have those, the two-thirds of those people, of the voters, who voted for Donald Trump, by and large, we're not represented in the legislature. 
the good guys, or maybe, I don't know if you could count them on one hand or two hands, <coughs> true conservatives, okay, well, if I really believe in limited government, the rest of these guys are evidently in, in now responding, or crony capitalists, or in, in the pocket of donors, or special interest groups. Um, I will never understand anything of any group the call higher education the accountability to be the state legislature because they hold the funding strings. And so why does the tail wag the dog? I don't know. Why is it, uh, what I've seen in 25 years, it seems as if the higher education lobby controls the legislature and not the other way around. And I've, I've never even seen the legislature do so much as hold that hearing or question anything that takes place at OU or any yeah. university. Mm -hmm. They seem to be scared to death. I went up uh, it must have been 10 years ago to see one of the most conservative legislators, um, a, a person who has a reputation for being an arch conservative, and she said to me, she said, get out of my office. She said, David Bourne, he is the most powerful politician in Oklahoma, and I don't dare do anything to offend him. Mm -hmm. That's sad. News media, another part of the problem. <laughs> see here speaking of evil, right? Uh, I wrote an editorial last year on socialism. Turned out to be the second most viewed article on the newsok.com for the whole year, even competing with news articles. I had 1,222 comments. When George Will writes, and he's a pretty good writer, he gets like three or four comments. I get 1,200. I think they made a lot of money off of that. You think they'd like to publish my stuff, right? They want people to click on that. And yet the last two editorials I sent to them, they wouldn't even consider, they rejected them out of hand because they talked about problems of OU. There's a conspiracy of silence, a cover-up. News media will not report on anything. Okay? And so I don't understand, you know, they don't have the resources, they don't have the influence or whatever. Okay, so, and so that's it. I'm, I'm done. That's, that's my spiel. And I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> having somebody that I'm going to say is putting himself out there in the public telling us what the issues are at the University of Oklahoma.
of you people here are afraid of David Bourne? That's the question I'm asking. I mean, I don't know what they're to be afraid of. We weren't afraid of Eric Holder when he came to town here three or four years ago. He didn't get, well, he didn't get to come to town, okay? The, uh, now, let me tell you something. Eric Holder, Attorney General for the United States, he's got some real stroke, okay? I don't know where David Bourne gets his stroke, but remember, this is the same David Bourne that would not give back some stolen art from, a, from, from the yeah, Nazi party. Right. That's the same guy. Yeah. And guess what? We won that deal too, okay? By somebody getting involved, and I'm going to say, you have a couple different people, uh, representing Paul Wesselhoff and also uh, representing Mike Reynolds, getting involved and demanding that this stuff be taken care of because they didn't want to do it. So as a group, we're not going to have a lot of quote Q and A time left because all this we've got to do. But your Q and A is really in your own mind. I want to do something to change the direction of you. I want you to want to do the direct change of direction of you. I am not attempting to shut anybody out of free speech at the University of Oklahoma, but I demand that we have the right to speak at the University of Oklahoma. And you should not be afraid if you want to wear a Donald Trump hat down there. No more than if you want to wear a uh, Anita Hill hat down there, or, or let's say a Warren, a Senator Warren. And I praise you very much for coming, having the courage to come to Hyman Club, discuss this kind of matter, because these small groups, we can change what happens at the University of Oklahoma. Okay? There's my little speech. Okay, David. Again, questions. Does anybody have a question? Here we go. Let's go right here. Raise your hand. Ask a very simple question. He'll give a very simple answer. We've got about three minutes to do this whole thing. Uh, do you have an equal like you at OSU? Uh, not so far as I know. Do you have any idea how bad they are or good? I'm an OSU grad. I've, I've heard from a reliable source that OSU is not so politicized. Next one. We've got a couple. We've got enough for a couple of questions. Okay, hold, hold on. Just a second. Hold on. I'm going to let our news guy here ask the question. Okay, question. In the past five years, I recall covering events where the Westboro Baptist Church came to Oklahoma City and protested. Uh, the burial of soldiers who were coming back uh, who died overseas. And those protests were protected by police officers in the Oklahoma City Metro. My question is, in less than five years, how does it happen that we go from police officers protecting the protestations of people like the Westboro Baptist Church to the president of the state's flagship university giving an arrest order to protesters in South Oklahoma. This, this uh, SAE incident in 2015 was like the Reich's tank fire. It was used as the justification for implementing all of these new, new uh, clamping down on free speech. And then when Trump was elected, it, it was like pouring gasoline on the fire. It, it really set them off because they, now they feel like they're under assault. And they have to strike back physically. Question. Uh, if we went to, my name's Ken, if we went to down to OU and wore a Trump hat down there, what, what are the chances we'd be physically attacked? Pretty good. 50%. Uh, could there be, maybe there could be some kind of sting? Uh, take I, would, I, would, I would have two or three people with video cameras. Yeah, and whatever course. you do, don't strike that. Just let them beat the hell out of you. The more they do, the better. And put that video up to get the news, get the news people down there to videotape it. Okay, unfortunately, our hour's up. The uh, big round of applause for Dr. Daniel. <laughs> not, not only for but also having the courage to step out. Dan Fisher, we learned this from the Black Rope Regiment. During the American Revolution, only 13% of the colonists even agreed with the revolution, but only 3% ever went into battle. So it takes courage to get involved. It takes courage, okay? But I can assure you, that's what the country's made of. In this realm, we've got some very, very courageous people. We've done some marvelous things at our state capital and also in Washington, D.C. Let's continually do that. I'm going to come up with a game plan. I want to have a rally at OU. Yes. The, uh, yeah. I want to have that rally. So what I'm going to ask you, when we have a rally, come to the rally, okay? 
Right? We can have rallies at the Capitol all day long rallying on different things. We need to have the real rally at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. And, demand, and demand with whatever kind of signage you want to have. And I'm, I'm going to say this this way, okay? Some people may find this offensive. I don't, but nevertheless, if you want to have a uh, Confederate flag with Trump on it down there, you're entitled to do that, okay? Be a, that, uh, or a Tea Party flag, or whatever kind of flag you have. I mean, but anyway, we are going to have a rally. We're going to have that. We're going to go also, we're going to go to our legislative body. We're going to ask them. I want to ask the pro Kim Schultz. I want to ask Speaker, or the new Speaker McCall. I want to ask these people. I want to ask Governor Fallon, Fallon, why is this going on at the University of Oklahoma? Why? Your leadership, we pay your salaries the same way we pay David Bourne's salary through higher ed. We demand higher ed quit doing what they're doing and put pressure on this guy that is, is holding our status lawsuit. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, have a great time. This is the next week, another great speaker and another agenda. Come out and talk to David, Dr. David Dickey and enjoy yourself on the menu.